the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni Narrated by Shelby Luke This is a Reconstructionist Radio Podcast. Please visit calcedon.edu to download this book and many others. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Shelby Luke and I will be reading from Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni. The Limitations of Law, Calcedon Position Paper Number 3 We fail to understand God's law unless we realize how carefully it limits man. God's laws prevent man from placing too much trust in law and from becoming a tyrant by limiting man's powers of enforcement. An obvious limitation on the courts of law is the requirements of corroboration. One witness alone cannot convict. Numbers 35-30, Deuteronomy 17-6, and 19-15. However, a more basic limitation is that many offenses, some very serious, have no penalties which any man or court can impose. For example, tithing is God's tax. Failure to pay the tithe is theft. It is robbing God. Malachi 3, 7 through 12. God himself imposes very severe penalties on this kind of theft, but he does not call for any man imposed penalty. Another example, Deuteronomy 22, 5, forbids transvestite dress. An example, the wearing of clothing belonging to the opposite sex. And 1 Timothy 2, 9 requires modest apparel of women, but no penalties for disobedience are cited. God's law covers every area of life, the family, the church, the state, our vocation, our relationships one to another, the use of the earth, sanitation, sexuality, warfare, boundaries, weights and measures, and all things else. The Lord makes very clear the curses and blessings, he places on disobedience, Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, etc. His government is total. We can never for a moment step outside of God's law and government. There is not a neutral corner or atom in all of creation. God is totally God, and His government and law are total, covering all things. At every point in our lives, we are face to face with the living God, in all things accountable to Him and totally his creatures and servants. Man, however, is not God, nor can he play God without being guilty of the great temptation of the evil one. Original sin is precisely this fact, the desire to be as God, to determine for ourselves what constitutes good and evil, and to rule all things totally. Among Nietzsche's manuscripts after his death was found a slip of paper on which he had written these words, quote, since the old God has been abolished, I am prepared to rule the world, unquote. This is the meaning of humanism's inescapable totalitarianism. Total government is a necessity, and everything in man requires it. If there is no God to provide it, then man must supply it. 
More accurately, when man rebels against God's total sovereignty and government, he replaces it with his own claim to total sovereignty and government. Thus, the present totalitarian claims and trends of virtually every civil government in the world are aspects of their humanism and their explicit or implicit denial of God. Humanism says of God, Our law and government provide a better way than God's, and ours is the way, the truth, and the life. In the United States, the efforts of federal and state governments to control churches and Christian schools are the logical results of their humanism. There must be sovereignty and law, and it must be man's, not God's, is their faith. Clearly, we are in the basic religious war, and there can be no compromise nor negotiation in this war. Humanism seeks to abolish the God of Scripture and rule the world. Humanism thus will permit no independent realm to exist outside its government. Every area must be controlled and ruled by humanistic law and sovereign power. The result is a growing status tyranny everywhere, and the death of freedom is in sight all over the world. The record of the church, while not as deadly as that of the modern state, is also none too good. The church, too, has often played God on earth and sought to exercise total government in the name of God. Protestants and Catholics alike have been guilty of going beyond God's law and usurping judgments which biblical law reserves to God alone. Humanists are very prone to exaggerating the evils of the church's record and Protestants and Catholics, too, often dearly love to believe the worst and tell the worst about one another. Granted, that humanistic historians have not done justice to the history of the Church, the errors there are still real. The problem can be illustrated by the history of a large evangelical church of the 1930s. It sought to be strictly fundamental, a commendable goal, but, in the process, it usurped God's prerogatives. For example, in terms of 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15, it held that Scripture has a requirement that women's hair be, quote, long, unquote. Well and good, but Scripture neither sets a length nor attaches penalties. It gives to no man nor to the church any such power. This church, however, decided to legislate against, quote, bobbed hair, unquote, and it specified a length in terms of inches. Anything shorter meant an appearance before the church court. Next, they specified the length of skirts, and so on and on. The results were devastating. First, the central emphasis in the life of this once strong church became externals, with everyone overly conscious of appearances. Women eyed one another to see who was flirting with the limits of the law, and everyone began to develop censoriousness. Second, the youth became rebellious. The gospel was now reduced to compliance with externals, and they readily rebelled as soon as they went off to college. It was very difficult to talk with any of the youth about matters of faith and doctrine. For them, the church and Christianity represented not faith and life in Christ, but a multitude of petty rules and regulations. Third, the church began to associate the purity of its faith more and more with its observance of forms and less and less with a solid knowledge of biblical doctrine. Faith was giving way to form. Rules lead to more rules, and the yoke of Pharisaic laws came to be rivaled. Much more could be added, but suffice it to say that finally a rebellion set in, but a sorry one. The antithesis to Pharisaic legalism and to playing God was seen as being more loving, and a neo-evangelical emphasis on love was the next stage in the slide of this church into modernism, and finally the social gospel, with the state now becoming the universal rule and lawmaker in their sorry, quote, gospel, unquote. God's law, by reserving, in one area after another, the right of enforcement to God alone, severely limits the power of all human forms of government. Neither church, nor state, nor any other human agency is empowered to play God. Moreover, we do not gain in holiness by becoming, quote, stricter, unquote, than God. We gain only in presumptuous sin. God alone is God. He does not delegate his throne nor his sovereign lawmaking power to any human being or agency.
to become, quote, stricter, unquote, than God's law, as one pastor boasted to me of being, is to imply a moral defect in God and his blasphemy. God's law thus allows man many areas of freedom to obey or disobey without man-imposed penalties. The result is a great freedom for man to sin or to obey than most man-made institutions believe is wise. Certainly, church and state have alike worked to limit the freedom God allows. One critic of biblical law has declared to me that any strict adherence in every realm to God's order would be, quote, disastrous, unquote, first, because in a few areas God's law is marked by an, quote, undue severity, unquote, as witness the death penalty for adultery. The family being God's basic institution, treason in the Bible is adultery. There is no treason with respect to the state. Second, in most areas, biblical law would produce, quote, anarchy, unquote, because no penalties can be enforced by man in any strict reading thereof. From the standpoint of Scripture, God's rule is not anarchy, but justice and freedom. Redemption is not by rules and regulation. Salvation is not by law. It is by God's sovereign grace through Jesus Christ. The redeemed man lives a life of faith and obedience in the Spirit and in terms of the inscriptured word. Our liberty in Christ is from the bondage of, or slavery of sin and the penalty of death, and it is a deliverance also from fallen man's way of salvation, a total government by the words of law, man-made law. If we take any law of God and alter it or go beyond it, we too become humanistic. We, quote, correct, unquote, God as God's over God, and we limit and finally destroy man's freedom under God. One of the more frequently repeated declarations of Scripture is, quote, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, unquote. Romans 12, 19, Deuteronomy 32, 35, 41, and 43, Psalms 94, 1, etc. Again, in Hebrews 10.30, we read, quote, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, unquote. In certain specified areas, and within carefully circumscribed limits, God gives to men and to courts of law the power to judge and convict. The word vengeance is in the Greek text, ekdikasis, that which proceeds out of justice. D.K. being justice. God declares that he alone is the judge and lawmaker. No man can go beyond his law word, for to do so is not that which proceeds out of justice, but out of presumption and sin. Thus, when the Lord declares, quote, vengeance or the enforcement of justice is mine, unquote, he bars man from playing God, from adding or subtracting from God's law word, or from attempting to rule over men in any way which exceeds God's word. Only as men stand in terms of this faith are they protected from being enslaved by or enslaving other men. The law word of God is man's only charter of liberty and man's defense against the tyrannies of state, church, and man. The redeemed of the Lord will stand in his word as free men. May 1979 Salvation by whose works? No man can be saved by his works. His salvation is the work of God, not man. This is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith, affirmed on all sides and dishonored widely. Our Lord, citing Isaiah 29:13, declares, quote, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Unquote. Matthew fifteen seven through nine. To believe that salvation is by grace and not by works means that all of man's works outside of Christ are futile to commend him to God and to affect his salvation. Now Augustine made clear that for a state or civil government to be built on any other foundation than the Lord and his word is to build nothing more than a band of robbers. Quote, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, 
The watchman waketh but in vain. Unquote. Psalms 127.1 How then can we imagine that any law, school, church, state, or any other thing can be a good thing or a good work when it is outside of Christ and has no place for him? How can we imagine that a state or school which neglects or despises the basic fact of all being, our Lord, and his sovereignty, can be anything but an abomination to him? Today, however, we have indignant churchmen waging war against pastors and Christians who work for Christian schools. These people defend the godless state schools and seek to drive away from the church all who criticize them. To defend statist education is to defend a humanistic plan of salvation which seeks to save the world by man's educational work. The same is true of the state. The modern humanistic state offers a cradle-to-grave plan of salvation. It is at war with Christ the Lord and denies his plan of redemption for its own. The state issues its own decrees of predestination, election, and salvation. Today, the Internal Revenue Service is seeking to break all who will not conform to, quote, public policy, unquote, in example, to the status plan of salvation. Its doctrine of sanctification means compliance with the state and its doctrines of social justice. To be a Christian today requires that we stand against the great false doctrine of works of our time, salvation by the works of the humanistic state. The Bible does not give us museum peace doctrines. When it condemns unregenerate man's works, it condemns not merely the Pharisees, but the statist educators, the humanistic statists, the Republicans, Democrats, Socialists, Communists, and others, the male and female, quote, chauvinist, unquote, and all others who see a hope of salvation outside of the Lord and his law word. By its own do-nothing, antinomian ways, the church today approves the works of humanistic educators and statists. The Bible did not merely condemn theological formulations of salvation by works. It declares false every effort by man to save himself by his own works. The Judaizers of Paul's day were wrong. So too are all organized bands of thieves who call themselves a civil government, and so too are all their schools. Paul declares, quote, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Quote, Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Unquote. Isaiah 2, 22. Salvation is the work of God, not man. May 1979. The Eschatology of Death, Chalcedon Position Paper Number 4. The dying have no future, and they know it. They speak of and limit their vision to the present and its sufferings. The future of the dying is a very limited one, and usually they do not go beyond a few days or more than a month in their thinking. Theirs is the eschatology of death, and men without faith have no other eschatology. Death and the certainty of death blots out all other considerations or else governs them all. The same is true of cultures. Death comes upon them rapidly when the faith of the culture collapses or wanes. The confidence which once enabled them as a small minority to dominate their world melts away, and they cannot set their own house in order nor control it. Dying cultures block out tomorrow having no confidence in their ability to cope with growth and the problems of growth. Dying Greece and dying Rome both saw themselves as overpopulated and as overwhelmed with peoples and problems, and so too does our modern dying statist humanism feel. It talks desperately about zero population growth and zero economic growth because behind such thinking is a zero future, an intellectual and religious bankruptcy. The father of modern humanistic economics, Lord Keynes, when asked about the consequences of his economic theories, quote, in the long run, unquote, answered simply, quote, in the long run, we are all dead, unquote. The growing disaster of Keynesian economics and a world practicing it should not surprise us. It was born without a future, and it was a product of an age which, 
like the dying, live for the moment and with no thought of the future. The dying live for the moment because they have no future. Converted into a formal philosophy, the name of such a state of anticipated death is existentialism. For the existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, man is a futile passion who wills to be a god but is faced only with the certainty of death. In one area after another, the eschatology of death governs our world. Yesterday, a letter came from a young man in Alaska which read in part as follows. I'm a surveyor, but I'm not registered by the state because I haven't passed a test. But I can't take the test because I haven't worked for a registered surveyor for eight years. At this time, there is no chance of employment for a registered land surveyor. I have to turn down work because I can't sign for it. I have an education in land surveying, and I feel that I could pass the test. The registered land surveyors have legislated themselves a monopoly. Alaska may call itself the last frontier or a new frontier, but it was born dead with an eschatology of death. Like dying New York City, it strangles itself with its own ungodly laws. This situation is not unusual but commonplace. In some cities and states, no young man can qualify to be a plumber or a carpenter or in various other callings unless his father is an important person in the union. The dying legislate against the future. This eschatology of death is common to all ages and classes. The old are very prone to damning the younger generations, but one of the menaces of our time is the growing demands on public funds by the aging. With the decline in the birth rate, the United States may face a crisis in not too many years when each gainfully employed person will be supporting two persons on Social Security and other forms of aid. Such a situation will not occur only because disaster will first overtake any society which works itself into such a predicament. The younger generations are no better, of course. They seek status solutions for all problems. Totalitarianism in the economic sphere, and therefore in the political as well, and total permissiveness in the moral sphere. This is irresponsibility, and irresponsibility is an urgent invitation to disaster and death. Not surprisingly, humanistic education is dominated by the eschatology of death. It creates a demand for instant results and instant gratification. It teaches children to play at being a state senate or a congress and to legislate feelings as the, quote, good, unquote, wishes can determine reality. The child matures physically but remains a child, demanding instant results and gratification. Utopia now without either work or faith. Education for permanent childhood means a society of incompetence, of all ages, whose politics becomes a demand politics. Because a demand politics produces disasters, the politicians who feed or gratify this demand are readily and angrily made the scapegoats for a graceless and irresponsible citizenry. In Speech and Reality, 1970, Eugene Rosenstock Cusey wrote of the social dangers and evils confronting modern civilization. These are, he said, first, anarchy. In anarchy, people in classes, quote, do not care to come to an agreement, unquote. Instead of ties uniting men, there are now divisions only, with each pursuing his own interest. Second, Decadence is a very great evil. Decadence is manifested at a critical point. Parents do not have, quote, the stamina of converting the next generation to their own aims and ends. Decadence is the disease of liberalism today, unquote. The consequence is the barbarization of the younger generation. Since they are not made heirs of the past and its faith, they become the barbarians of the present. The modern family, like the modern school, is a school for barbarians. Quote, the only energy that can fight this evil is faith. Faith, properly speaking, never is a belief in things of the past, but of the future. Lack of faith is a synonym for decadence. Unquote. Rosenstock Husey held. Third, in his list of evils is revolution, which is a consequence of anarchy and decadence. The old and the past are liquidated or eliminated as meaningless and irrelevant, which indeed they have made themselves to be by their lack of faith in their destructive education of the young. 
Fourth in the list of evils is war. War is a sign of impotence. A system or philosophy of life which has no power to convert becomes imperialistic. For the zeal and faith of peaceful missionary work, it substitutes brutal terror. A failing faith resorts to war, because it lacks the contagion of faith and conviction and can only force men into its own system. War is the resort of those who lack true power and are declining. In brief, Rosenstock Husey said, Anarchy is a crisis created by a lack of unity and community. Decadence is the collapse of faith. Revolution means a lack of respect, indeed a contempt for the past and present. War is an indication of a loss of power and a resort to force to perpetuate or advance a system. All of these things are aspects of the eschatology of death, but there is still another aspect. Because the modern taboo is death, people are prissy and hesitant about the plain facts of dying. It is often assumed out of fear that most deaths are costly, long, and lingering, which in most cases is not true. Death often comes quickly. It is also assumed that death comes to a bland man, again, not true. It comes to Christians and to unbelievers, and with many shades of difference. Death among some of the ungodly who die a lingering death unleashes a radical hatred of the living. One man a lifelong reprobate and adulterer, abandoned his wife as, quote, too old, unquote, and moved in with a younger widow whom he enriched to a degree. When terminally ill, he was ordered out by his mistress, and only his wife would have him. Instead of gratitude, he daily showered her and their children with hatred, profanity, and abuse, hating them for their faith and health, quote, wasted, unquote, on them, he would shout, because they, quote, didn't know how to live, unquote. This is an aspect of the eschatology of death, its hatred for life and the living, and its will to destroy them. At the heart of this is what wisdom long ago declared, quote, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death, unquote. Proverbs 8:36. We are surrounded today by dying men whose eschatology is death and whose politics, religion, economics, education, and daily lives manifest what Samuel Warner has called, quote, the urge to mass destruction, unquote. Of this world system, Revelation 18.4 declares, quote, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues, unquote. In spite of this, all too many professing Christians not only refuse to separate themselves, but are insistent on the morality of sending their children to humanistic state schools, an act of anarchy. We have described the nature of the dying. What about the dead? The dead cannot wage war, nor revolution, nor manifest hatred. The dead have their place and they remain within it. No corpse can outgrow its coffin nor conquer an inch of ground beyond that which it occupies. The dead stay in their coffins. All too often the church is like a coffin. Instead of being a training ground and an armory for the army of the Lord, it is a repository for the dead. The people within have not the life and power to occupy any other ground to establish Christian schools, to conquer in the realm of politics and economics, to quote, occupy, unquote, in Christ's name, even one area of life and thought, and to bring it into, quote, captivity, unquote, to Jesus Christ. Luke 19.13, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Where Christianity is confined to the church, it is dead. And it is only a corpse claiming that name, but having none of the life nor the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3.5. Christianity cannot be caged into a church and confined there like a zoo animal. Quote, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Unquote. Romans 1.16 Power commands. It exercises dominion and it reaches out quote, to every creature. Unquote. Mark 16.15 With the good news of Christ's redemption and lordship. It works to bring all things under the dominion of Christ who is, quote, King of kings and Lord of lords, unquote. 
Revelation 19, 16. Jesus began and ended his ministry, quote, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, unquote. Mark 1, 14f. That kingdom brings with our redemption through his atonement and continues with our exercise of dominion with knowledge, righteousness, and holiness over every area of life and thought. Coffin churches have no such gospel. Instead, they summon the living dead to enter the safety of their particular casket, far removed from the problems and battles of life. They encourage their people to gush about the peace within the coffin and to embellish the coffin with their time and effort. Coffin churches have no ministry to a dying world. When our Lord declared, quote, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, unquote, Matthew 28, 18, he did not limit that total power which he, as king of creation, exercises to the narrow confines of man's soul. Christ, quote, all power, unquote, is over all things in heaven and in earth in their every aspect and over every atom, moment, and possibility in all of creation. He is the Lord, Lord over all. To limit his lordship and power to the church is as absurd as limiting the sun to shining over Europe or selected portions thereof. Even less than we can limit the sun to one continent or one country can we limit Christ the King to one sphere or institution. To do so is a denial of his deity and his practical atheism. Because, quote, all power, unquote, is his, the Lord of creation sends his elect messengers out to, quote, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, unquote. Matthew twenty-eight twenty. All nations are to be summoned to bow before their king, both as individuals and in every aspect of their lives, civil, ecclesiastical, educational, familial, vocational, and all things else. An eschatology of life and victory allows us to exempt nothing from Christ's dominion and lordship. A sickly term in Reformed theological circles refers to God's, quote, well-meant offer of the gospel, unquote. The image of God it invokes is a false one. God's word is never a, quote, well-meant offer, unquote, but always the command word the word of power which redeems and regenerates or reprobates. To be, quote, well-meant, unquote, smacks of impotence and failure, and it speaks of men whose powers are frail, fallible, sinful, and dying. It belongs to eschatologies of death. God's word is the command word, the word of power, the word of life and death, because it is the omnipotent word. Only of him can it be truly said, quote, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Unquote. 1 Samuel 2, 6 Apart from the Lord, man has no future. In every area of life and thought, quote, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unquote. Psalms 127, 1 Education, in its essence, is always the transmission of the basic faith and values of a culture to its young. Education is thus, in essence, always a religious concern. In many cultures, the basic values have been nonverbal and nonliterary, so that education then has not been concerned with literacy, but with other skills. A few cultures only have been concerned with literacy, biblical faith and culture in particular, because of the insistence on the knowledge of the scriptures. Modern humanism, as against classical humanism, underrates verbal and literary skills. Thus, not only is education a totally religious subject, but the curriculum, its contents, and its methods are all religious, in that they reflect the faith and values of a culture. To allow our children to be in humanistic schools is to be unequally yoked and to serve two masters. June 1979. Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Bruce's John Rushman. Lord willing, we will be reading again next week. Until then, 
May God bless your endeavors as you serve the one and only King Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the love he has shown us by his pain, the very price. It was there at Calvary's tree, where he died for you. Christ has set you free, set you free.